In this video, we're going to focus on editing fill stitches. And fill stitches aren't quite as complicated as, as like um, satin stitches are to edit. But you can see I have this design up that we worked on in creating the fill stitches originally. So let's go ahead and just take a look at what we can do with fill stitches. So we're talking about two different things. We're talking about editing the shape and maybe the angle line start and end points. And then we're also talking about changing the properties. So first let's go into the edit shape mode by clicking after it's selected, I can click this edit shape. And this is where I can change the points and rearrange them, add more, take some away. If you want more information on how to edit the shape of a line, you can look at the um, artwork, editing artwork because it's the same way. The only thing that's different with this is we have a start point that's a green dot. And we have an end point that's a red dot. So this means it'll start stitching here and it'll end stitching here. And then we have an angle line and we can change the angle line to whatever we want it to be. If I right mouse click on the line, you'll notice that we have a set angle and you can choose a, a very um, standard 0, 45 degree, 90, or 135. I use these quite a bit. Um, I might do a 45 degree angle, and you can see that that's a perfect 45 degree angle there. And so when I'm when you're dealing with a editing a, a fill stitch, you want to minimize the amount of times that it has to move to another object and start stitching again. So you want to keep it in a very continuous motion. So if the angle is right here. If I'm going to start down here, I'm going to try to get it to the point where it will start stitching and it will keep going as much as it can. And I'm just kind of following this line. And so ending it, I would want to be somewhere about right here um, because actually right here, because it's going to keep going and that might be a good ending point for it. And it will minimize the amount of times it has to jump around. And by that, I mean, when it starts stitching, it's got to go from here down to here to catch up with this before it keeps going. You can see that does a very that does it very well. It only has to back up right here. But if I change that angle or the starting point and the ending point, let's say I do something more like this and I right mouse click, watch how it stitches this one out. It's got to go and it's got to catch up there. It does a pretty good job. But um, there's just, it can really change. Um, you can make it have to jump back and forth a lot. Like for this one, I would say that probably doing it at a zero degree angle is going to cause more issue. So if we start out here, you can see that it, for some reason, this is like really lagging right now. There we go. Um, and it's got to move up and go to that point and it's got to move over, come down. You can see like all the movement going on. That's not what we want. We want to get it, keep it as continuous as possible. So that's what I wanted to kind of, you know, express in that. The next thing is we just talked about editing the start point, end point and the angle lines. The next thing is looking at the stitch properties. And so the properties box, you have a fill tab, you have underlay, you have a gradient, you have a push and pull, you have a control type, which this isn't gonna really do anything on a fill stitch. Um, you have a start and end commands, and you have the connection type, and then your standard um, transform tools. So looking at the first tab, the fill tab, this is where you can change the type. You can turn it to a fancy fill if you want, and that's gonna give you like a pattern shape um, you can do a motif and that'll fill it with a motif as you can see there go ahead and turn off this artwork and um, but most of the time we're working with a standard um, fill type and what you can do here is you can change the pattern that you see so pattern one is the default that is a really good one um, it usually has less stitches to it um, and then you can, but you can see that you can get different effects here by choosing a different pattern. And so I tend to just stick with the pattern one. I don't like to do too much with a pattern fill. Um, I will choose 
some of them like um, random is one that I'll choose to give it more of like a like to an animal like a fur look in a way but pattern one is my go-to and then you have the ability to change stitch length and that is important you do want to change it quite often like in this case I would do at least a four and the longer the stitch length is the less stitches it'll take to fill it and the longer stitches the more loft it has so it covers the fabric better as well point four is usually what I use for a density. Um, then let's look at underlay. Underlay you have a bunch of different options that are a little bit different than working with the satin stitch. You do have a contour. Let me turn off everything else that goes around the edge. Um, this is a good underlay to incorporate. You can see there it's um, it goes around the edge. That's the contour. And you can do multiples. You don't have to just stick with just one. Um, parallel that's going in the same direction. I don't recommend that for fill stitches. Um, when you're doing a fill stitch, the default is perpendicular. And the reason is, is that the stitches are going the opposite direction of the fill itself. And it just really works much better with the fill stitch to do that. You also have these over here, full lattice, lattice and edge travel. So full lattice is going to create like this web you can see it goes one direction then it comes back so it's like basically a 45 degree angle and a 135 degree angle and then it does the fill so it's a pretty heavy underlay you can change the settings of it so you can in here like density I would probably change that to a three or a four and hit apply and you'll notice that that density will be um, lightened up so it won't be so thick of an underlay and that's a good thing to know that you can do that and then lattice is just goes one direction at like a 45 degree angle as opposed to the full lattice that goes um, two directions goes a 45 and 135 so lattice will go in like a 45 degree angle and then the stitches like I said um, parallel is the most popular um, edge travel just means it's going to travel along the edge of the fill as opposed to in the middle so you can see there's not all these extra lines in here because when it's going to go and travel it's going to run around to travel so right there like it runs around the edge instead of running through the middle okay so um, my go-to's a lot of times are a contour and a perpendicular. I like that combination when I'm working with um, a lot of the fabric. So I like to have that the stitch along the edge and I like to have the um, that choose perpendicular because I meant to do true. Yep, I did. So that's my go to and I usually like a density of about a three instead of a two, which is the default. So I do change that quite often. And sometimes I'll even change this to a four to give it a little bit longer of a stitch length. It does help it quite a bit. The next tab is the gradient tab. So gradients are basically, um, I can choose any of these linear increasing. Um, let me go ahead and turn off the underlay so you can see what's really happening here. And you can see that that looks a little um, not so good right there. And I did, choose edge travel so it didn't run along the middle but a lot of that has to do with this shape it's because it has to come back and go forward and so this is just a difficult shape to work with a gradient that's a little bit better but typically when you work with a gradient you want to work with something that's more like a square or a circle and that gives you the best um, opportunity to get it to work well. So I just created that one. I'm gonna look at the start and end point. If the stitches are going this direction, I'm gonna want it to flow straight through. So I'm gonna put the start on one end and on the other so it'll go all the way up there. And by doing that, if I select this, I'm gonna to go to and turn off the underlay and come over to gradient. If I do a linear increasing, you'll notice that it'll get, the density will increase as I go down. So it's lighter up at the top, 
darker at the bottom. Let's go ahead and change that to linear decreasing and that'll be the opposite. Lighter on this end, darker on this end. You kind of see how that works. Convex, um, you'll see it's tighter in the middle and lighter on the outsides. Um, concave is the opposite. It's um, more dense on the edges and lighter in the middle. So you can see kind of how that works. You can use these in combination. So I could copy this and paste it. And so I have a duplicate and I could change the stitch color of one. And let's just take a look at what this does. So if I come over here, this one's using concave. So let's choose convex for it. If I click off, you'll notice that the dark green is dense at the ends. And then the light green is dense in the middle and light on the ends. So you can see that they kind of work together. So you can do that with um, gradients. Let's go ahead and come back over here and let's, those are the different types. Let's go back to none and hit apply so we get back to original. Now we can take a look at push and pull. Push and pull is very important in embroidery and in the master class you learn all about that. Um, I usually work in absolutes. You can do a percentage and basically pull compensation is it adds extra to the edges in the direction the stitches are going. So if stitches are going this direction, left to right, it's gonna pull in on the sides. So when you add pull compensation, it makes this fill a little bit larger and to compensate for that. Push is um, helps with the buildup of thread. As stitches go back and forth, and they're, if they're dense, like a normal density, it'll push up and it'll actually make it grow in height. So you want to back those stitches up. So you want to add to the width and shrink on the ends to account for the pull and the push that takes place. And that might be a little bit much for you, but it's a definite, it's an absolute in embroidery. So let's go into the pull compensation. Generally for a fill stitch that's a good size, I'll do 0.5 and I'll add that to both sides and hit apply and you'll notice that this will get wider. So let me come down and just make this quite a bit smaller here. So that way you can kind of really see it when I get done here. So if I come back here and I put this at zero and hit apply, notice it'll shrink. See that shrink on the edges. So let's look at the push by millimeters. If I want to back this up 0.4 on both sides, I hit apply. You can see it backs up those stitches. Um, typically, I'll do 0.5 for most fills, and then I'll come down to the push compensation. I'll do it by line, and I'll do two, and I'll hit apply. And by line, basically what that means is these are all lines right here that go back and forth. It's going to take two of those lines out at the top and two of the lines out at the bottom. And that's basically 0.4 millimeters. So it's gonna give you the, the right amount of backing up of the stitches. So that's kind of, um, you have the ability to do that. I can do it by millimeters or lines. It's kind of up to you on how you wanna do it. I find it works a little bit cleaner when I do it by line. Next thing, um, this doesn't really apply. That's more for satin stitches. And start and end commands, we've talked a number of times about those. Um, just something that takes place before this stitches out is a start command and something that takes place after it stitches out is an in command. And you have the ability to do a jump, normals default, jump, trim, stop, or frame out. And um, we've addressed those in other videos. Hopefully you've seen those. If not, you can go back and watch about the steel stitch because I talk about that, those commands in there. Tie-in and tie-offs, these are your lock stitches. Before an object starts stitching, it's a good idea to have it tie in, especially if it's the first thing that's taken place in the design or the first thing that takes place after something that is has been trimmed or will be trimmed. And that just locks it in. And the tie off is the same thing. It locks it off at the end so that it won't unravel. Um, that's if there's gonna be a trim either by the machine or manual, you want to include a tie off. If it's not going to be a trim, if it's going to continue to the next stitch and it's right next to where this one ends, you don't need to tie it off. But 
Um, by default, it does put a basic tie-in and a basic tie-off in, and it it's not bad to keep it on there just to be safe. Definitely use basic. Don't use triangle, especially for the um, tie-off, because that creates a little triangle shape, and it will be visible on a tie-off stitch. On a tie-in, it won't be. So you can use it for a tie-in. Definitely don't use triangle for a tie-off, though. I typically use basic for everything. In the general, this is what controls, let me go ahead and take this off of 3D, the edge type. So if I come over here and I choose sharp, it's gonna be more like a zigzag, you can see that? It doesn't drop down and do another line, it's kind of um, doing like what would be a zigzag. So let's, let's go back here and I'll show you, this is default right here, chiseled, and watch how it'll drop down and do another line. So you can see that? It kind of drops down and goes. That's standard, It's um, it might you might think that it'll show gapping, but that is the ideal um, connection. And square, we'll square it off. You won't see it right here because it's too tight of a density, but if I change this like to a two, hit apply, it's going to do these, it might even do it on a one, let's see here. Yep, it will, so it'll just square off that end. I don't recommend this unless you're trying to intentionally show fabric through and doing a really light density. I would say probably at least 1.5 to 2 millimeters would be, um, if you're going to do something that's like that, it's okay. Um, then you have a one side and that just kind of means it's going to go there and back, go down there and back. You can create some unique effects this way. Um, it, it's more so for satin stitches though, um, when you'd utilize that. Let's go back to chiseled. That is the default. And so you can see there, and I'm going to go back and change this to a 0.4 density to get it back to normal. And that's kind of your normal fill stitch. The other thing that you have is the last one, which is the transform tab, where you can just make something larger or smaller by giving it a specific value or upping it in a percentage or lowering the percentage, you know, make it smaller or larger, depending on if you go higher than 100% or lower than 100%. And then you can rotate it by a set amount right here if you need to. So those are the basic things that you can do in editing a fill stitch. And um, so you definitely want to play around with the settings, create a simple circle or whatever, and just start playing with the different patterns, see what they look like. Um, you're not going to break anything. Just uh, open it up and change it and just see if you find something that you really like. Because there's things like this um, thatched basket that kind of gives it if you're doing a basket, you might want to use that because it'll give it kind of that look. Um, smooth is one that is, it is very smooth looking. It's a good fill stitch. Um, pattern one, like I said, is the default. And that's what I use most often. So don't be scared to play around with these settings and get familiar with them so that you know how they work. So that when you're doing your project, you can make the little necessary changes that you might need to make. So we'll see you in the next video.